All right, the course is called Marriage Prep 101, Getting Ready for the Big Day. And uh, this uh, first lesson entitled uh, Desperately Seeking Someone. And uh, I understand the feeling that some people have, if, if some, some have been married for a couple of years, you know, they say, ah, I don't need that, I don't need that marriage. I'm already married, you know, we've been married four years, you know, and some people have been married 40 years, you know. And I try to tell them, every time there's information about marriage, whether you've been married one year or 50 years, you always gain something from it. Not only, from, not only to put to use in your own marriage, uh, but those of us who are older and who have children who are married, you know, your children come to you for advice from time to time. And it's always good to have fresh information uh, about marriage if you're older. And if you're younger, you know, if you're a young married and you've got a couple of little kids running around, I remember when that was our situation, you don't have time to work on your marriage. You're so busy running after the little kids, you're so exhausted, you don't have a whole lot of time to invest in the relationship. So it's good for you know, people at different stages of marriage to get information, course on marriage. And then of course, if you're not married, uh, whether you've never been married or you're, uh, you're an unmarried person, whether you're a widow or divorcee or whatever, uh, perhaps the opportunity to remarry or marry for the first time may come uh, in your life. And it's always good to have information about, um, about marriage. So with those ideas in mind, we'll kind of get into the material that I've prepared here. I believe that marriage is God's greatest act of creation for several reasons. One, it was the last thing he actually created after everything else was made. You know, he did this on purpose. Uh, it was the answer to the problem of loneliness. Genesis 2.18, it's not good for man to be alone. That's not a good thing. Marriage was the answer to that. Uh, it is the only created thing that perpetuates spiritual beings. Plants and animals reproduce, but they have no soul. Families, however, have souls. Marriage is the institution uh, that God has created as the framework to reproduce eternal beings. It's an important thing. And it is a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. We know that as Christians, Ephesians 5, 22 to 27. We'll talk about that you know, later on down the line. So no matter how long we've been married, we can always benefit from a study about marriage. The information gained may improve or cause us to appreciate our existing marriage. Widowed, single, or divorced individuals can learn more about one of God's divine institutions for self-edification or to be able to teach each other. And then finally, for those hoping to marry or remarry, this series will provide information to help shorten the learning curve in relationship building and establishing priorities and guidelines when seeking a mate for life. We, we, we get more information about buying a lawnmower than we do about choosing a mate. Sometimes put more thought into buying a dress or, or buying a TV than information we get about what kind of mate should I have for, for my whole life. So the first lesson in the series deals with one of the most stressful and discouraging phases in life, and that is searching for a marriage partner. Now we're going to get into when you're married and you know, relationship building, but let's kind of start at the beginning here, shall we, in this first lesson. For a large number of people in our society, the problem is not maintaining a happy marriage, the problem is finding somebody to marry. Our culture and fast-paced life have created difficulty for people in the process of finding a suitable mate. You know, the high expectations of how we ought to be living by a certain age have forced people to delay marriage until much later in life. You know, men and women delay marriage until after college 
or after their career starts and you know, kind of catches you know, gear. Families are begun when women are in their late 20s or, or, or 30s. You know, in, in 1919, 100 years ago, average age for marriage for men, 25, for women, 21. Today, 2019, average age for men marrying, 30. Average age for women, 28. I mean, not terribly old, but when you think, you know, you're, you're thinking about getting married and you're, you're in your 30s, you haven't even thought about having a family yet, there's almost a decade between what it was 100 years ago. We no longer live in closely knit families surrounded by familiar communities where friendships and dating and marriage were kind of a natural part of a lifestyle. You know, your cousin introduced you to a friend. You dated your brother's buddy. Today, people live in cocoons. They're self-sufficient in their cars and videos, cell phones, computers. They order food by phone. They have two jobs. They see family at Thanksgiving, maybe at Christmas. We don't have the natural network to meet eligible and known partners. In other words, you know, you, you, your cousin introduces you to this guy you know, who's, who's lived in the town that you've lived in all of his life. You know their family. Oh, you're so-and-so. Isn't uh, your sister go to there? Yeah, oh yeah, I used to go to school with. You know, you know their family. You've got their background. You kind of know their reputation. Today, you know, contacts are manufactured in, and I'm not speaking necessarily to Christians here, but I mean in larger society. Today, contacts are manufactured in singles bars, singles weekends, singles groups at church even, singles magazines, singles websites. It's hard just to meet somebody in a natural, non-threatening way. I mean, speed dating. <laughs> You know, they talk about speed dating where they organize a thing, you know, and they've got, I don't know, 100 people come and, and they've got tables and uh, you have three minutes and you sit there with somebody and you talk and back and forth three minutes, you know, and the, zzz, the buzzer rings. Okay, well, nice, nice talking to you. Yeah, put that on your scorecard. And then you meet somebody else for three minutes, you know, so who are you? Okay, what do you do? Blah, 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 blah. You go back and forth, you know. That's okay for a movie, for a comedy, you know, to, you can make a pretty good comedy movie out of that, but real life, finding a partner? I'm glad I didn't live in that era. So add to all of this a general confusion among, among both men and women concerning their roles, and what you end up with is, in, in a, generation of, of, is a generation of single people who are desperate in their search for somebody but they're never quite sure what that somebody looks like or what that somebody should be. As Christians, we're blessed because God provides His word to guide not only the married people, and of course, in the following lessons, we're going to be talking way more about married people than single people, but He also gives information that the unmarried can use in their search for happiness. So here's some rules to guide us in the search for a spouse. If you're already married, you don't need this. You can pass them on to your kids or your friends, but if you're unmarried, maybe these can be helpful to you. Rule number one, don't be desperate. Don't be desperate. One of the most anxious times in our lives is when we want to be married, but we're not. She wants to settle down and start a family. He's lonely and wants to share with someone. She sees her friends getting married and she feels that she's being left behind. A little, a little panic is starting. He's having trouble dealing with his sexual desires as a single man. She's got a mother who's always dropping hints. That was a nice boy, he's nice. What about Joey, my cousin's son? Mom, he's 14 years older than I am. 
and it goes on and on. All the little things that seem to say to the single person, everybody in the whole world is married except me. Panic. That desperate feeling will make you do some pretty foolish things. For example, you'll make the decision that marriage must not be for you, and to save yourself the disappointment, you'll stop being available. You'll just let yourself go emotionally. And what happens is when you let yourself go emotionally, you usually let yourself go physically as well. Or, You'll compromise. You'll compromise your principles and your morals. You'll do and say things to try and get someone to marry you. You'll use sex or you'll give up your beliefs or you'll make promises that you don't intend to keep just so you too can be part of the married one so that you can be in that club. Or the saddest, you'll marry somebody you don't really love. You'll marry somebody you don't really respect. Worse still, you'll marry somebody who doesn't really love you. But out of desperation, you'll go ahead and do it anyways. You know, we'll fix it later. We'll just, we'll, we'll fix it later. You know, we'll, it'll all come out in the wash. Well, some stuff comes out in the wash, but not marriage. The dictionary the dictionary defines the word desperate as a state of recklessness caused by despair. In other words, we do foolish things because we have no hope. If we're not Christians, I can understand a person putting their hope for happiness in a marriage partner, but as Christians, we need to realize that our hope lies within Jesus Christ not the institution of marriage. What does the Bible say? For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you, whether I'm married or not. God is my hope, not marriage. And then of course, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. He's our hope for lasting peace and joy. So we become desperate when we put our hope for satisfaction and joy and peace in anything other than Christ. And you know, if I get married, everything will be okay. Nope. If I get married, I'll finally find peace of mind. Nope. That's not what marriage was designed to do. Marriage fulfills basic human needs, but the things we absolutely need for happiness, things like joy and peace of mind and confidence before death, wisdom, self-control, those, those are the elements that create Happiness, these elements are provided us through Christ, not marriage. Paul talks about stress or desperation in 1 Corinthians. He says, but I want you to be free from concern. There's that. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Notice that the stress is experienced by those who marry, not those who remain single. So being single is not easy, but being married is not easier. <laughs> People think, oh, it'll get easy when I get married. No, because <laughs> when you're single, you only have to deal with yourself and your stuff. When you get married, you have to deal with your stuff and you have to deal with her stuff or his stuff. Not impossible to do, but you're living in, a, you know, in dreamland if you think, oh, when I get married, everything will be okay. Uh -uh. There's a whole other you know, experience being married. 
There's happiness there and satisfaction, of course there is. But it doesn't just come all by itself because you say, I do. If you're desperate to get married, it's usually a sign that marriage isn't what you really need at this particular time. Another important rule in the search for a mate, know what you're looking for. The problem with desperation is that it blinds us. We, we don't see clearly what is real. We only see what we want to see. If you're going to find someone, it helps to know what you're looking for. Usually it saves time and, 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 and energy by eliminating people and situations that don't meet your requirements. You know, in choosing a partner, it's good to have some idea of what the parameters are. Some things are negotiable, some things differ from person to person, but in order to have the best opportunity to succeed in marriage, there are a couple of things that should be non-negotiable for the single Christian person. These are the non-negotiables. Number one, don't marry a non-believer. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, he says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. Now in this passage, Paul is warning the Corinthians not to abandon Jesus' teachings for pagan teachings. In other words, don't be yoked with unbelievers in their teachings and practices about religion. That's the primary meaning of this passage. So the passage doesn't talk about marriage, not directly, but it can be applied to the marriage relationship. Experience teaches us that when Christians marry non-Christians, in most cases, not all, the Christian loses his faith. The Christian becomes more and more ineffective as the marriage suffers. This is because a Christian's goal is to please God and to serve others in Christ's name. This creates conflict in the partner or with the partner if the partner doesn't have the same goal. You know, parents should strive to help their children to come into contact with other Christians and singles need to make the effort to network with other Christian singles. If you never associate with other Christian single people, chances are you're not going to find one to marry. If 98% of your friends are non-believers, you have a 98% chance that you're going to marry a non-believer. You know, if you, if you make friends with non-believers, then you're going to date non-believers. And if you date non-believers, then you're going to marry a non-believer. I mean, that's just common, that's just logic. Non-negotiables. Marry for love, not for lust. First Thessalonians. Paul says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Today, the dating scenario is demonstrated in the movies in this way. Step one, boy meets girl. Step two, boy and girl have sex. Step three, boy and girl live together. Step four, maybe they get married. Maybe, <laughs> I watch these movies sometimes and, and, there, and there are two children running around you know, and the guy kneels down and said, will you marry me? And the kids are running, their kids are running around. Go, oh, I thought you'd never ask, huh? <laughs> Non-Christians are led by their passion, not by God. Don't become involved with someone based on lust. Choose somebody that loves you and that you can love in return. When choosing for love, examine the kind of love that they have, not just the kind of body that they have. Three. Know what you're looking for. You know, don't marry an unbeliever, marry for love, not lust. 
I'm talking about the ideal here. If you're saying, oh dear, I didn't do this and I didn't do that. This is not a class to make anybody feel guilty. This is a class to say, here's the ideal. Here's what we ought to be shooting for. Here's what we need to be teaching our children to shoot for. I recognize none of us in this class have you know, managed to do all these things. That doesn't mean we can't at least you know, establish what we ought to be shooting for as Christians. So know what you're looking for and you know what you're looking for by asking certain questions of yourselves about that person. For example, do they love God? Someone who loves God will know how to love you. And you know they love God if they're not ashamed of Jesus, not ashamed of obeying Him. Secondly, do you, do you love what you know about this person? A worthy partner is one who possesses certain characteristics that you learn about with time. You find out that the person that you're getting to know is an honest person, a person who has a, a sense of humor, a person who's gentle or generous or merciful. Maybe not all of these qualities, but some of these things. You don't have to have sex with someone to find out these type of things. You don't have to have sex with someone to find out if they tell the truth regularly or if they have a forgiving heart. If these are the things that attract you about that person, then the love you're feeling is, is real, is genuine, is not blinded by physical passion. I mean, God is the one who created physical passion, so there's nothing wrong with physical passion. But usually physical passion tends to kind of blind us. I think one of the reasons that God says, you know, let's keep the physical passion for inside the marriage you know, boundaries, let's keep it for that, because outside of that, it, 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 it blinds your thinking. You can't see properly what, what, what you're getting into. You can have sex with somebody you don't love, you can have great sex with somebody who would make a terrible marriage partner. And of course, does the other person love you? You know, the root cause of most divorce is selfishness, not adultery. One partner or the other partner or both partner are selfish. They just want to, you know, their own way or their own thing. The adultery comes after the selfishness. The major cause of most arguments in marriage is whose needs are going to be met first. <laughs> when Lise and I were first married, we, I'm not much of an arguing type of guy, I'm not a, much of an arguer, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and neither is Lise actually. But I remember when we were first married, We'd call them fender benders. You know, they weren't huge all out screaming matches, but they were fender benders. We'd crash into each other, you know, you know be barking matches, you know, and we couldn't figure it out, you know, what, what was wrong. And of course, before we had children and you know, she was working and I was working, we realized at some point that you know, we both finished, at, at, you know, I worked in an office in those days and so did she, and we got home at about the same time. So we got home at about 5.30ish, you know, something like that, six o'clock. We were both tired from work and we were both hungry. And both of us wanted to eat and relax. But somebody had to get the food going. And, and, and that was where the accidents happened. We were hungry and we were tired and we each wanted our needs met. I wanted to be greeted nicely and be nice to sit, relax, and then have supper. But you know, we didn't have any children running around, so she wanted to be greeted nicely and she wanted to relax before having something to eat. And we found, oh, that's the problem. It's not that we don't love each other, it's that we're hungry, we're tired, and, and there's a bit of a struggle as to who's going to get their needs met first. And you know, we, we worked that stuff out, no big deal. But a lot of times that's the, that's the problem. It's easy to see if your partner really loves you. Just examine carefully if your partner is interested more in your needs or their needs. 
There's an old poem that I'd like, I rarely do poetry, but there's an old poem that I'd like to read to you. It's called A Woman's Question. And it's by uh, Lena Lathrop, and here it is. Do you know you have asked for the costliest thing ever made by the hand above? A woman's heart and a woman's life and a woman's wonderful love. Do you know you have asked for this priceless thing as a child might ask for a toy? Demanding what others have died to win with the reckless dash of a boy? You have written my lesson of duty out. Manlike, you have questioned me. Now stand at the bars of my woman's soul until I shall question thee. You require your mutton shall always be hot, your socks and your shirt be whole. I require your heart to be true as God's stars, as pure as his heaven, your soul. You require a cook for your mutton and beef. I require a far greater thing, a seamstress you're wanting for socks and shirts. I look for a man and a king, a king for the beautiful realm called home and a man that the maker God shall look upon as he did the first and say, it is very good. I am fair and young, but the rose will fade from my soft young cheeks one day. Will you love me then mid the falling leaves as you did mid the blossoms of May? Is your heart an ocean so strong and true I may launch my all on its tide? A loving woman finds heaven or hell on the day she is made a bride. I require all things that are grand and true, all things that a man should be. If you give all this, I would stake my life to be all you demand of me. If you cannot do this, a laundress and cook, you can hire and little to pay, but a woman's heart and a woman's life are not to be won that way. Marry for love, because it's the only thing that taxes and old age cannot take away from you. Isn't it the thing you, you see when you see an elderly couple walking along in the park or something? I mean, elderly, you know, 90 years old, uh, can hardly move and, and they're holding hands. And you say, oh, isn't that sweet? And well, what is the thing that, that's so sweet about it? Well, they still love each other. They still love each other enough that they still want contact with each other. You know, the, the sex drive is gone by then. There's none of that going on. Kids are raised, grandkids, great grandkids. There's nothing left, nothing left except the true love that brought them together at the beginning. Isn't that all that we want? Isn't that what all of us, as I rather say, really want? You know, marriage offers security and comfort, pleasure, family, challenge for growth, opportunity for service, lifetime friendship. It's a worthy life and I sympathize with those who desire it and have not yet realized this goal. But in your searching, remember, keep your hope for happiness firmly fixed on Jesus and you'll be satisfied whether you marry or not. And secondly, don't commit your life to someone who isn't committed to Christ first and you second. If you're not second to God, you won't have a first rate marriage. Thirdly, remember you're on God's timetable, not your timetable. Don't try and rush him. It's not to you to know when you're absolutely ready. If your faith is strong in Christ, it's not just that He knows when you're ready. He'll get you ready. He'll prepare you. He'll bring to you the right, the right person. And then finally, unmarried, the first step in finding the right partner is becoming the right partner yourself. You know, what do I do until you know, I find the right one. Well, you know, work on being the right one. Work on being the right partner. Uh, usually that's uh, quite edifying, whether you find right away or not.
Okay, so there's the first session in Marriage Prep 101. First lesson, I think I wrote down the, uh, yeah, next time, mature enough for marriage. So we're going to talk about maturity. What should we be looking for? That wonderful discussion moms have with their daughters, their dads have with their sons. You know. uh, am I ready for marriage? You know, uh, what do you say to that? Well, we'll have some ideas on that. And as I say, as we progress through the series, we'll get into, okay, now that we're married, what happens? You know, and what happens at this stage? And what should we be going through as we work our way through uh, marriage? All right, that's our first lesson for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.